with the new Netflix Masters of the Universe cartoon showing that a lot of characters that we grew up with in the 80s have changed in the new series, whether it's their role or their haircut or generally just their motivations and, well, or general look of the character. Whether they're old characters or new characters, the Netflix show is definitely changing some things. And there's been a lot of mixed feedback, for lack of a better word, online about whether these changes are good or bad, pro or con, etc. Well, I wanted to make a video to show that this isn't the first time Masters of the Universe has changed. In fact, the brand has always been about change. While most of the public thinks of this when they think of Masters of the Universe, the filmation show and the main characters, and they even think of things like He-Man's power sword being the source of his power and what he uses to create his transformation, this wasn't always so. And the changes from Masters of the Universe are just scratching the surface. And it ranges from things like the original version of Man-at-Arms not having a mustache. I mean, most people think of him as having facial hair. But that wasn't something that came along until Filmation added it to age him up. Or characters like Merman, who went through a very dramatic visual change from his original concept art to the final figure to make sculpting simpler. Essentially uh, simplifying the figure to make it easier to paint. Stratos also went through a lot of changes. In the beginning, he not only had a different colored fur or skin and wore necklaces and belts and carried around a giant staff, and he was actually originally a member of Skeletor's Evil Warriors. He didn't become a good guy until later on when the balance of number of good guys versus bad guys was needed. Originally, he was one of Skeletor's minions. In fact, Merman actually wasn't one of Skeletor's minions. He started off as a good guy. So there were a lot of role reversals in the early concept, and this wasn't just in concept art. This made it out into the original storyline. The mini-comics told the original story in the way that the public got to know the brand. So eventually, Stratos did become He-Man's ally, but it's not how he started out. And that's barely scratching the surface. I mentioned earlier about Key Man's sword being the source of his power, and with that in mind, it really should be pointed out that this wasn't how the brand started. In fact, not only did He Man not use a sword, but the whole concept of Prince Adam and having a secret identity, whether or not he had flames shooting out of his wrist or was just a guy hanging out the palace drinking Ecto 1 cooler juice boxes, well, that was something added later on. Adam first showed up in some of the DC comic books well, well after the 82 launch, but slightly before Filmation. And he didn't use a sword to transform into He-Man. He and his pet cat ran into the Cavern of Power, which was a cave up on a hill. And inside, he merged into the power source that was in this cave for reasons, and magically transformed from Prince Adam into He-Man and Battle Cat, where they could emerge and go on their quests to save Eternia and the universe and, uh, you know, everything in between. So, no sword, no, uh, no magical transformation in front of Castle Greyskull, and his main weapon was his axe. And this was shown in so much of the original artwork. He isn't even holding his sword in the cross-sell art on the original toy. And part of this, a big part, is because his original story, he wasn't even Prince Adam. Talk about change. He used to be some guy who showed up leaving a tribe in the jungle and, you know, waving goodbye, good luck, have fun storm in the castle. And uh, he went off on adventures and he happened to run into the green goddess, or the goddess, who gave him an axe, a shield, and a harness. These were his main weapons. So he was now armored up. Well, he also got a belt and boots because, you know, he's got to be fashionable. But there was no sword. It was all about his axe, and it was all about his harness, which was the source of his power. In fact, the original idea was that different harnesses would give him different powers. The one he came with as a toy gave him a force field. So if he was shot by a laser beam, the laser beam would bounce harmlessly off the force field he generated from his harness. 
And the idea was you would buy, as a, as a customer, new harnesses and new outfits for He-Man, kind of like Barbie or Big Jim, other successful Mattel lines, and each new harness would give him new powers like invisibility and flight and the ability to control waterfowl. So that is why in so much of the original packaging art and even continuing well beyond the launch, you always see He-Man just with his axe, something he almost never uses in the content, in the animation, or in the movie, the 87 movie. He's always wielding an axe and a shield. Looking at the original Castle Grayskull art, not only there he is with his axe and his shield, no sword, it's because the sword, it existed in the original concept, but it had a very different purpose. It was not the source of He-Man's power or what caused his transformation. Well, there was no transformation. There was no Prince Adam. The sword originally was the key to getting inside of the castle. And that is why He-Man and Skeletor, the original figures from 82, both came with half of a sword. You ever wonder that? When you bought He-Man and Skeletor, you got like half a sword. It wasn't even a full sword. And for those who uh, figured it out, they could clip together. The One had the male half, one had the female half, and you could push them together to make a full sword. Granted, one side would be gray and one side would be purple, but that's what the whole original storyline was about. It was about obtaining both halves of the sword so that one could gain entrance into Castle Grayskull and gain control of its mysterious powers. And that's what the characters were trying to do. Anytime they got both halves of the sword, it became a key. You could insert it into the castle, which you could do in the toy as well. And now you gained entrance into Castle Grayskull. Castle Grayskull wasn't where the sorceress lived. It wasn't He-Man's sort of base. It was really the MacGuffin of the play pattern. And the swords would have to come together, so you would have to basically fight over the swords and turn them into a, a, an object, not a weapon. So it was a key. It was not an aggressive, pokey, stabby, you know, sword, <laughs> if you will. I mean, of course, you could use it for that, but that's why He-Man came with an axe. And then once you took over Castle Grayskull, you would go up and you would flip around the flag, either from the good side or the not-so-bad good side. You know, it's kind of like the Schwartz. It's got an upside and a downside. So whichever side was raised over Castle Grayskull was showing who was controlling the castle, whether it was Skeletor and his forces or He-Man and his forces. And that's how the original brand worked. So, you know, you look at things like Netflix and the changes they're making to characters like Tila. I mean, the changes they're making don't even come close to the changes that existed for her when she launched. When she originally came out, she didn't even represent a single character. The action figure you were buying was actually two completely different characters. So, let me explain. If you look at the original 82 Tila, and you look at her sort of nameplate, if you will, she's noted as Tila, the warrior goddess. Well, that's because when she was originally created, she was designed to be not just Tila. She was the warrior. This is the warrior before she got the name Tila, which came from an elephant, but that's a uh, YouTube video for another time. And then this is the goddess, who eventually became known as the sorceress. Two completely different characters. But the decision was made to, instead of tooling two female characters, they would tool one female and then give her a different outfit, different armor, that you could recreate both looks. So with the armor, she's the goddess. Without the armor, she's Tila. This is something that you see all the time, even in modern action figures. We think of it more as what's called a head swap. So a great example is this Nick Fury figure from Marvel Legends, one of my favorite Marvel Legends figures. And he came with three different heads. Nick Fury, the, uh, the head with the, uh, the, the helmet on, if you will, and then he comes with a second head that is not Nick Fury, if you will. And this allows you to take one action figure and by swapping around the heads, making multiple characters. So you could do Nick Fury with his regular head and take the helmet and put it under his arm and it looks like he's carrying around the helmet. Or you could put the helmet on the body and this could be Nick Fury with a helmet on. Or it could be a generic S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. But while that's up for debate about whether or not that's just Nick Fury or a variant of Nick Fury... 
The third head is not Nick Fury at all. It's Dirk Angler, who is a completely different character. And this allows you to have two action figures with one body. Dirk is a character from the comic books, and yeah, he's not Nick Fury. He is, as I said, he's an entirely different action figure or character altogether. It's an entirely different kind of flying. So when Tila was shown in the mini-comics, which was the original content, she was shown with blonde hair and no snake mask to visually show that this was the warrior. And to show that it was a different character, she was colored green and given the snake headdress. And this was the goddess, eventually renamed the sorceress. So a way of differentiating that there were two completely different characters but you could make one purchase. So really, you could buy two Tilas, two action figures, and dress her up both ways. Eventually, the goddess became the sorceress, but then eventually, eventually, with classics, we actually made a goddess figure and separated them back out to two characters, purely because, well, it was all about selling toys, and the goddess really was a repaint of the Tila tool that we already had. So... It was a cool way of finally getting a legitimate action figure of the goddess, but this is the way Tila was supposed to be back in, in the 80s. You were supposed to have two completely different versions, and instead of releasing them as two different action figures to buy, it was just one figure. The armor represented the head swap, as opposed, like, you know, with Nick Fury, as opposed to actually getting a head, you just got armor, but that signified it was a different character. To further confuse matters, eventually it was also revealed that Tila was a clone of the goddess that was raised by Skeletor to be his bride, because that's not icky at all, and then they combine into one character, and then they uncombine, because comics are weird, to borrow from another YouTube page, but uh, or channel. So yeah, Tila's been through a lot of changes. And once she was made two characters, then they no longer had eight figures in the original lineup. So, because eight were promised, Zodak was added at the last minute as another evil warrior in order to balance out the promised eight figures for sales of four good guys and four bad guys. Which is also why Zodak was originally a bad guy, because, you know, everything has to be evenly, uh, you know, dispersed. Because you don't want to upset the balance. So, yeah. Tila's been through some changes, He-Man's been through some changes, and they're going to continue to be through changes, but the brand is all about change. And that's part of being a He-Man fan, is sort of, uh, you know, accepting that and deciding which parts of the brand you like, and that's great. I hope this video clarified a lot of the reasons for changes over the years, and if you like it, share it with others. It really helps the channel. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.